Hello everyone, this is Mike Dowding with the SD Mines Physics Department. Our next topic in Chapter 9 is going to be the conservation of linear momentum. And just to recap from our last video, momentum is the product of a mass and its velocity. And because velocity is a vector, we must also treat momentum as a vector. We know from previous class discussions that velocity can change over time. As such, the momentum can change over time. But when we do that, what we end up doing is reproducing Newton's second law which says that when we apply a force to a mass, that mass begins to accelerate. But we can also work uh, just with the idea of a change in momentum. And anytime we have a delta statement, that is final minus initial. And so we'll have a final velocity and an initial velocity paired with the mass of the object and that will tell us how the object changes its momentum and we have a, a special notation for that the book calls this J and gives it the name of impulse so we know whenever there's a change in momentum there is an impulse associated with that and then if we notice the, uh, the momentum equations that we have here look somewhat similar to the equations that we had for kinetic energy. With kinetic energy, we have 1 half mv squared. And if we were to factor out the m, the v, and another v, then we have the momentum. And so our kinetic energy could be represented as one half the momentum times the instantaneous velocity of the object. But it might be more um, convenient to take the equation that we have for kinetic energy and multiply that by mass and divide by mass at the same time. And what that will allow us to do is it, it gives us the extra mass term that we need in the numerator so that we can represent this as one half the momentum squared divided by the mass of the object. And then uh, what we can do from there is if our momentum changes, in other words, if there's a, a change in momentum, then we can represent the change in the kinetic energy as a result of that and then we can uh, take that idea back to chapter 7 which dealt with work which was also a change in potential energy for the system so these these are all different ways of just combining materials that we already know about but now we're going to uh, dig a little deeper into the idea that momentum is a vector. And we're going to start considering collisions in this part of the chapter. And we already know that we have things like uh, conservation of energy, conservation of mass. Uh, there's a lot of different conservation laws in our science courses. And the next one that we have to consider is conservation of momentum. And specifically, we're going to have the conservation of linear 
momentum. And that right there is the key word that reminds us of the fact that momentum is a vector. So let's take a, a mass, maybe a ball of mass m, traveling with some velocity v. If we put the mass and the velocity together, then we have the momentum of that object. Now what if that mass, we'll call it mass 1, which has initial velocity, collides with another mass, mass 2. What will happen to the momentum of the system? And there are, there are a few different outcomes that can occur depending on uh, the materials and the system itself. One possibility is that mass 1 will come to a halt and so the final velocity of mass 1 after the collision will be 0. And then mass 2 will continue on with some final velocity that we'll call v final 2. Now this implies that mass 2 had an initial velocity of 0. And this is where we, we want to pick up on the idea of billiards. So maybe mass 1 is the cue ball, and mass 2 can be any other billiard ball on the table. Maybe it's the 8 ball. So this is one possibility, and if you've ever if you've ever played billiards after you strike the cue ball, um, a lot of times it will it will impact another ball on the table, and it almost looks like the cue ball comes to a, a halt, and it propels one or more of the other billiard balls on the table. So that's the that's the first case scenario that we have here is that all of the momentum from mass one gets transferred into mass two. And that does follow along with our idea of conservation of momentum. What we want to do is produce an equation that shows that the momentum that we started with in the system equals the momentum that we end with. So let's try that. Let's start over here on the uh, the left hand side and let's consider all of the objects in our system that have mass and velocity and there are two of them we have mass 1 traveling with its initial velocity v naught 1 we also have mass 2 which technically has a velocity assigned to it but it's zero so all the momentum in the system was originally located inside the first ball, which in this case would be the cue ball. The eight ball was not moving, but then after, so we've, we've taken care of the, the before situation, now there's an impact. So this, this squiggly line that I've drawn here um, indicates the the transition from before a collision to after a collision. So we'll, we'll consider that the, the collision. And then I need to figure out what is the momentum in the system after the collision. And that's going to come from this information. So after the collision, mass 1 is now static. It's just sitting there, not moving. So we know that that momentum will be zero. Plus, whatever momentum mass 2 has after the collision. So we had a, we had a zero for the momentum of the 8 ball before the collision. We've got zero for the momentum of the Q ball after the collision. And all that's left now is the momentum that we started with 
mass 1 times initial velocity 1 has to equal mass 2 times its final velocity. And this is how we conserve our linear momentum. Now there's, there's two things that we have to keep an eye on here. If you remember our conservation of energy equations, we just had to keep track of the different types of energy. But energy was not a vector. Momentum is a vector. So we not only have to ensure that we have equal numerical values on each side, but we also have to ensure that the directions are equal on either side. And that can be done just by looking at the diagram. When we uh, look at the left-hand side with the momentum before the collision, the momentum in the system was oriented towards the right. And then after the collision, we still have momentum oriented to the right. If we need to, we can always include a, a reference frame in the system just to show that the uh, directions associated with those initial and final velocity vectors do in fact need to be equal to one another. Question is, do the initial and final velocities have to be equal to each other? And that's only going to happen if the mass of the cue ball and the mass of the eight ball are equal to each other. But that's not actually the case. Um, I'm going to get on my phone here and just Google some values here. Mass of cue ball. And it apparently could not hear me, so I'll try it again. Mass of cue ball. There we go. So we have a mass of approximately 0 0.17 kilograms. But the other billiard balls on the table have a mass that is slightly less. And the reason for that actually is uh, a design feature for uh, most billiard tables. Um, if you've ever played billiard tables, you probably had to had to pay like 50 cents or a dollar and you, you plug in some quarters into the table. And then what happens is anytime you sink one of the billiard balls into one of the pockets, they drop down into a slatted track. I'm trying, trying to draw 3D on a 2D surface doesn't always work. Um, try that again. So we have a, a slatted track. that the balls will roll through and the the track has a, a space or an opening between the two boards that is just wide enough for the solids and the stripes to fall through but the cue ball is just a little bit too wide and so all of your all of your solids and stripes will drop down into the collection bin and your cue ball will continue out um, to that collection pocket so that you can continue playing your game. So the fact that we have two different masses is actually uh, of a benefit to us because now we can solve for the mass of the eight ball after the collision and it's not going to be the same as the initial velocity of mass 1. So let's assign an initial velocity to our cue ball. Um, maybe we say that this is 5 meters per second. And so that means that the initial momentum in our system has to equal the mass of the cue ball, 0.71, times the initial velocity, 
5. And that's going to give us, let's see, 5 times 17 is 85. We've got a decimal. So 8.5. 8.5 what? Well, we, uh, we have units of kilograms and meters per second. But we saw in the last video that we can also represent momentum as newton seconds. And that's what I'm going to use here. Okay, 8.5 newton seconds is how much momentum we have in the system before the collision. So that must be the amount of momentum after the collision. And because we know the value of the 8 ball, 0.16, we can then solve for the magnitude of the final velocity of the 8 ball. Because the mass of the 8 ball is a little bit less, in order to conserve momentum, we're going to have to have a larger velocity for our, uh, our 8 ball. And I just want to double check some of my values here. I, I did have a, a decimal error here. That wasn't 8.5, it should have been 0.85. So 0.85 newton seconds equals 0.16 times the final velocity. And so the final velocity of the 8 ball after taking on all of the momentum of the cue ball comes out to be 5.31. So it's actually faster than what the the cue ball had for an initial velocity. And so this is why whenever there are collisions, uh, especially with like vehicles, um, usually the smaller vehicle is the one that loses because so much momentum from the larger vehicle gets transferred into the smaller vehicle, and the smaller vehicle has to accept a greater change in its individual momentum, which means that that smaller vehicle is going to have to experience a much larger average force, which we also talked about in a previous video, and we said that that was the that was the big reason for people either getting seriously injured or killed is that they experience too much of an average stopping force during those collisions. Well, we said that this was just the first of possible outcomes. Another possible outcome is that after the collision, the cue ball could still have some velocity associated with it. So we'll start again with our, our cue ball with some initial velocity. Over here we have mass 2 which is sitting there minding its own business. It's not moving. And then after the collision, again depending on the type of collision that we have, we could end up with both masses having some non-zero momentum. So maybe, maybe mass 1 does not give up all of its momentum after the collision. Maybe it only transfers a portion of it to mass 2. And in that case, um, that should be mass 1. In that case, we want to figure out uh, how, do we, how do we take care of that conservation of momentum. Well, it's really no different from what we did in the previous set. We're still going to map out the individual momentums of each ball before and after the collision. 
except this time not all of them are going to be zero. So we'll start we'll start with our initial momentum, which is made up of momentum from the cue ball and momentum from the eight ball. Um, right now the the eight ball has velocity of zero, so our initial momentum for the system is still just what we have from the cue ball. And if we want to consider using the same values that we did over here, I'm fine with that. We can let the initial velocity of mass 1 still be 5. We can let the mass of the cue ball still be what it was before. And so we still have the 0.85 newton seconds worth of momentum in the system. But now, that momentum has to be shared between mass 1 and mass 2. Alright, so let's say these two billiard balls strike and the velocity of mass 2 is measured to be 6 meters per second. So mass 2 has 6 meters per second to the right. That's our positive direction, positive x. And the mass for that 8 ball was the 0.16. So let's put that together in our calculator. 0.16 times 6 equals 0.96. Now, right away, you're probably thinking, well, that can't be right. Doubting must have screwed up with his numbers or something. And um, I, I'd be the first to admit it's not the first time. But let's just go with this. Let's say we, we started with our cue ball traveling that fast, and then uh, we had some equipment available that could measure the velocity of the eight ball. And, well, this is what we measured. So how is it possible to start with 0.85 newton seconds of momentum and have more than that after the collision? Well, it's not possible unless mass 1 has some negative amount of momentum associated with it. And what that would mean is that mass 1 is not necessarily moving to the right anymore. It could have ricocheted and bounced back after the collision. I just, I just drew it this way because um, I really didn't know any better. But through the math, the only way that I can have these two numbers together and still get an equality is that algebraically this unknown combination mass 1 v final 1 is going to have to be negative and right there that sign notation tells us that final velocity is going to have to be in the other direction it's going to have to be in the negative direction so m1 v1 final plus the final momentum from mass 2 has to equal the initial momentum of the system. So we'll go ahead and subtract 0.96 newton seconds from each side. That's going to result in a negative 0.11 newton seconds. And so it is confirmed. Uh, we cannot have a negative mass, but we can have a negative velocity. And that velocity, since we have to have 0.11 newton seconds of momentum associated with our mass of 0.17 kilograms, the final one has to be 0.647 meters per second in the negative direction. So this is, this is the idea behind 
the conservation of linear momentum. We have to conserve the amount of momentum in a given direction. So far everything that we've done has been one dimensional. I started with a certain amount of momentum in the x direction, 0.85 newton seconds, and I ended with the same amount, the same net amount after the collision. There's nothing that says that our objects can't change direction from positive to negative as long as we keep track of the total amounts in the system. Well, those were one-dimensional examples. Momentum is a vector, and vectors can be one-dimensional, they can be two-dimensional, they can be three-dimensional, but that's not going to change the definition behind our conservation of momentum. What momentum we start with in the system has to equal the momentum that we end with in the system. Now, this is not to say that an individual object cannot change its momentum. In the previous video, we talked about uh, individual objects changing their momentum because there was a force applied. Over here, we're discussing everything in the system. So the entire system, we have to account for all of the masses and their velocities. Uh, the same thing was true for conservation of energy. We had to conserve the energy that was in the system. That did not mean that specific energies for individual masses could not change. So let's take this idea of conservation of momentum and let's apply it to a two-dimensional system. So we'll have x and y respectively. And I'm going to start off one-dimensionally. So here we have mass 1. Mass 1 has some individual, um, or excuse me, some initial velocity. And I'm not, I'm not going to bother putting in numbers this time. I want to show you a general solution for the 2D system. Then later we can start plugging in numbers. And so our, our cue ball, we'll let mass 1 continue being the cue ball strikes another ball on the table. Again, this could be the eight ball if we wanted, but I'm going to shift the position of the eight ball down just a little bit. And so what we have here is kind of a, a glancing shot. The cue ball is going to come in and when it strikes the eight ball, the result is that the eight ball will be deviated down and to the right with its final velocity. And maybe mass 1, the cue ball, is deviated up and to the right after the collision. So again, our, our squiggly line here, this implies that a collision has occurred. So we have before the collision and after the collision. And it is our job to conserve the momentum. Because momentum is a vector, vectors have components and I've always found it to be easier to do any of our vector math in component form. So I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to break it up into one conservation of momentum equation just in the x direction and a second 
conservation of momentum equation, which is just in the y direction. Once I get both of these equations put together, then I can always take those expressions and put them back into their full vector notation if I need to. So for starters, uh, let's go with the before situation. Before the collision, what is the momentum of the system? Well, we have our mass 1 traveling in the x direction. So all of mass 1's initial velocity is going to contribute to the initial momentum of mass 1. So we have mass 1 times all of the initial velocity of mass 1. Mass 2 is not moving, so it doesn't have any initial momentum in the x direction, so that's it. We just have mass 1 contributing. But what about for the y direction? This is a 2D system now, so now I have to account for any momentum in the y direction before the collision, but, well, there is none. I don't see any vectors pointing in the y direction, and that's because there is no momentum in the y direction initially. Well, that should make things easy, because that means, what, there can't be any momentum in the y direction after the collision. But that doesn't seem to be what the picture is showing us. The picture says that there is, in fact, a component in the y direction for each of those billiard balls after the collision, just as there are components in the x direction after the collision. So is it valid to just say that this is zero? Well, in a way it is, but that should tell us something really important. If the momentum in the y direction after the collision has to be zero, then that means that the momentum of each ball in the y direction has to be equal and opposite to the momentum of the other ball. And so what we can do now is we can still set this equal to zero except when we add these together one of these terms is going to have to be negative. And we can, we can see right here that the velocity component of the second ball in the y direction is pointing in the negative y direction. And so adding that momentum is really just adding a negative term. And so there's our, there's our conservation of momentum along the y direction. I'll clean that up just a little bit more. But we're still not done with the x direction. So after, after the collision, the cue ball continues in the x direction with some x component of its final velocity, as does ball 2. So we have mass 1, final x component, plus mass 2, final x component. And this will remain a positive because both of those vectors, or both of those vector components are pointing in our positive direction. So there's the second equation. And really there's nothing wrong with those equations. They're, they're showing us exactly how 
the momentum in the system has to be conserved. But after the collision, mass 1 travels off in this uh, direction, which is up and to the right. Mass 2 travels in some direction that is down and to the right. And it would, it would be so much better for us if we had some kind of an angle relationship that we could use for mass 1 and mass 2 so that we can describe the components of those vectors in more detail. So theta, theta 1 is going to be the angle that mass 1 travels with respect to the x-axis and theta 2 that will be the angle that mass 2 travels with respect to the x-axis. And once we have that, we can rewrite all of these final velocity components using our trig identities. So one step at a time, what do we have? We have v final 1x. V final 1x is right here. And that is the side adjacent to our angle theta 1. That is cosine. So m1 v final 1 cosine theta 1. If you haven't noticed, I'm really stressing my subscripts here because we don't want to get this stuff mixed up. Then for mass 2 in the x direction, right here is the component for mass 2, and it is also the side adjacent to our angle theta 2. That is another cosine. So there is our conservation of momentum for the x direction. And now we have to do the same for the y direction. So 0 equals the final y component. Uh, maybe we'll use this color instead. The final y component for mass 1. That is the leg opposite of angle theta 1. That is sine. M1 v final 1 sine the theta 1. And then we have our minus. And v final 2 has its final y component pointing down. That has already been taken into consideration with the minus sign. We don't want to plug in a double negative. But we can see that that leg is also opposite of theta 2. So that is, that is another sine relationship. F2 sine theta 2. All right, so there's our conservation of momentum in the y direction. Two equations with how many terms? Now this is why I didn't want to plug any numbers into this because my brain cannot put all of these puzzle pieces together. But the terms that we have here are mass 1, mass 2. We have the magnitude of the initial velocities for each mass. We have the magnitudes of the final velocities for each mass, and we have the angles associated with those final velocity vectors. So there are eight pieces of information within this system of equations. I have two equations, and at the most, the number of unknowns that I can have is 2. Okay, For a system of equations, you have to have the same number of equations as you do unknowns. Otherwise, 
you're going to have a real difficult time solving for anything. And so if I were presented with a problem like this, or if you were presented with a problem like this, say on your homework, then I would have to provide you uh, six of the eight pieces of information that we see here. And now you can see why my brain can't put all this together on the fly. But if I did give you some information, could you solve for the final two missing pieces? And the answer should be yes. You should be able to uh, perform some kind of algebraic substitution so that you can solve for the missing pieces in the system. All right. Um, I think now would probably be a good time to end this video because in the next video what I want to do is start exploring some example problems with uh, different objects that are colliding in different scenarios. Right now we've just had uh, billiard balls, but we want to consider some other systems of collisions and I think that would be better uh, to start on an, another video. So, until then.